Hello, everyone. Welcome to Looking to the East. I'm your host, Steve Zerker. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, those of you that follow my program, uh, you may recall that we talked about the assassination of the former Prime Minister Abe a couple weeks ago. And um, I wanted to cover that topic once again with a very special guest that we have with us today. And uh, his name is Michael Penn. He's been on my show before to talk about other topics. He's the president of Shingetsu News Agency in Japan. Michael, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you spending some time with us to talk about what's going on in Japan regarding this assassination, and in particular, some of the research that you've done on this topic. So the first okay, thing I'd like to ask you, Michael, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Well, it's, it's great to be with you, Steve. Again, I, I always enjoy uh, talking to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we, we need to get together uh, when I'm up in Tokyo next time, have some coffee and chat. So um, the first thing I'd like to ask you, I'm in Hawaii right now. I mean, I've got the Aloha shirt to prove my bona fides there. Uh, so I'm not in the country getting the day-to-day -day news on the repercussions of the assassination of Abe. Obviously, when he was killed, uh, it was international news. Whenever I get a, a text from my mother about something going on in Japan, I, I, knew, I know it's huge. So she sent me a note uh, <clears throat> just after he was killed. But how is the country responding in, in Japan right now? Is it fading from view somewhat, or is it still topic A, or you know, in the top list of things that Japanese people are discussing or you read about in the Japanese media? Uh, I would say that it's definitely fading. It's been a few weeks now. Uh, you know, I, I think that if you go out to the general public and you, you, know, you listen to the conversations out there, uh, very few people are talking about Shinzo Abe at this point. Uh, because, you know, it's it's not the sort of issue that really has a lot of, how should we say, implications to go far beyond what already happened. Uh, and, and Japanese don't usually talk so much so deeply or so often about sort of uh, what you might call inside the beltway in the U.S. Uh, context. Here in Japan, we call it Nagata Chonai, sort of uh, uh, discussions about Japanese politics. It's, it's big uh, in the Japanese political world still. Uh, it has ramifications that are that are still coming out there, but I think in the greater society, uh, most people have already moved on. Okay, wow, that's a little bit surprising to me uh, because it was such a dramatic news story on on two two levels. Of course, an assassination is so unusual in Japan, but then in addition, it was Abe, who was, I, to my mind, the most important political figure in the country, even though he was not actively the prime minister. Well, just to stop you there. Uh, I would say I would agree with you that, in my view, he was the second most powerful man in Japan at the time of his death. You put the prime minister first? Yes. OK. Yeah, maybe I, I was thinking that Abe was still pulling the strings in the background you know, because he, he was controlled. trying to. He was trying oh. to, but he was not succeeding 100 percent. Oh, OK. So Kishida yeah. is, was even when Abe was alive, was kind of emerging from... Uh, Correct. Within the shadow of Abe and his influence, because he was prime minister for so long previously. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so that being the case, uh, what caught my eye, I mean, actually, you published an article a day or so after the assassination, which I thought was fascinating. And before we went live on air, you actually, we were talking about it, you actually broke the story in terms of the connection between the Abe family and the prime minister former prime minister himself, and the Mooney Church. So maybe you can talk about that. And I think uh, I'm familiar with the Moonies, but when I talk to my family and my friends, maybe they're not so familiar with it. I mean, they were, Moonies were big, maybe what, in the 80s or the 90s, and maybe they faded somewhat. So perhaps, Michael, you can talk about what you discovered in Japan and the article that you published, which I thought was so interesting. And also maybe, tell uh, this, the audience who the Moonies are. Right, okay, so uh, so yes, the, the word Moonies, uh, as you say, uh, became very uh, well known and, and uh, sort of part of the US political debate, maybe in the early 80s, I think was sort of maybe the high point for that. Um, but uh, I'm going to call them the Unification Church, uh, which is closer to their formal name. Uh, and that's also what uh, they're described of in, in Japan, the, 
Toitsu Kyokai, which is a direct translation of Unification Church. Um, and uh, so, yes, they were a, a, a group which emerged uh, shortly after the Korean War uh, in South Korea uh, with uh, essentially a, a, a take on Christianity, uh, sort of, you know, one of these groups that uh, sort of take Christianity as a basis, but then kind of adds their own sort of special characteristics to it. Uh, and uh, they were particularly notable for being uh, very, very uh, anti-communist. Uh, and this is kind of what, uh, where the story begins with Japan. Uh, so uh, Shinzo Abe uh, has a maternal grandfather. His name is uh, Nobusuke Kishi. And Kishi was also prime minister from 1957 to 1960. Uh, during, he was a member of Hideki Tojo's cabinet during World War II and was uh, uh, basically imprisoned as a class A war criminal. Uh, but essentially he made a deal with the US government uh, after the war and he became, and he is the person who pushed through the US-Japan alliance in 1960. So he basically moved from being a class A war criminal to the U.S.'s best ally in, in Japan, and this is this is the grandfather of Shinzo Abe, uh, and uh, so after uh, Kishi had lost his premiership in 1960 after massive protests, uh, uh, that the biggest in Japanese history, in fact, uh, in the sort of mid to late 60s, he was introduced to Mr. Moon, who was the head of the Unification Church, and they seemed to sort of bo have bonded over their shared anti-communism. Both of them were very, very uh, sort of hard right uh, anti-communist sorts of people. And uh, we don't know exactly, it's still research is still gonna need to kind of dig out exactly what the connection was. But there, it was believed by some people, including the person who killed Shinzo Abe, that Kishi actually invited the Unification Church to come to Japan. Uh, whether or not that's true, we'll have to find out. We do know that the church's headquarters was built on land that had been owned by Kishi. So the, the exact connection still needs to be uh, figured out. But what is pretty clear is that, uh, is that the connection between uh, Kishi and Moon continued not only until the end of Kishi's life, but into the following generations. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Shinzo Abe's father was a, a man named Shintaro Abe. And he, would, he rose to the level of foreign minister of Japan, and he probably would have been prime minister had he not died a little bit younger than, uh, than other people. Uh, and he also had a connection where uh, the Unification Church was uh, providing political support to him. And a sort of more or less off the radar, uh, we get glimpses here and there that uh, there was a deal, uh, sort of a informal or formal, we don't know, between the Unification Church and the Japanese ruling party, or at least parts of the Japanese ruling party, uh, which was originally facilitated by Abe's family, apparently. And wow. the, the deal was that the Unification Church members provided election support uh, uh, that could mean like putting staff members onto campaigns to go out and canvass uh, the public. Uh, it meant, of course, voting for ruling party candidates and in return, the part of the deal was is that the Unification Church could then sort of go to Japanese private families and ask for major donations to the church and do basically their activities unmolested by investigations or police or other concerns. So that appears to be the overall deal that was made. Uh, it probably was breaking down in recent decades. Probably this century, that connection was considerably weaker. Uh, uh, although, but, if I can interrupt, Michael, you did you did note in your article that Abe, as a fall of last year, did a video endorsing the Unification Church. So it exactly. may have weakened, but it was still there. Exactly. That, that was actually going to be my next point, is that in, the, uh, I think it was September of October of last year, uh, Abe did join an event. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, the former U.S. president, was also at that event. Uh, and really? they made, Yes, they gave video wow. messages, basically. Uh, endorsing the the uh, Unification Church, you can this is you can find these things on YouTube, by the way. So wow. it isn't uh, it isn't a big secret. Uh, and so Abe uh, spoke and Trump spoke, and they both somewhat endorsed the Unification Church and correct. what a wonderful organization it is and stuff like that. Uh, basically, they added their prestige to the prestige of, of the 
of the current church. So, and in fact, there was a group uh, in, in Japan, which uh, a, a group of lawyers who are very much against the way that uh, sort of the Unification Church took massive donations uh, from Japanese families, and uh, including the family of the man who ended up killing Shinzo Abe. Uh, and uh, they criticized Abe at the time last year. Uh, so uh, this was off the radar of almost every political analyst or, yeah. you know, it, it was it was kind of a smaller side issue, mm -hmm. but uh, it ended up being the issue that uh, that took Shinzo Abe's life. Yeah, one thing you you noted also in your investigation, um, <clears throat> and I, I recommend any viewers who want to find out more about this and find this interesting, because there is a parallel, as Michael just pointed out, to American politics. In the Unification Party and apparently the Trump Trump Republican Party, uh, to go to the Shingetsu news agency website and you'll find this article along with other very interesting articles that analyze what's going on in Japan. So one thing you did uh, mention in that article is that back in the 1980s, the amount of revenue that was being generated by the Moonies. I, I just have to call it that. I know you're, you're calling them the polite name, Michael, but I, I can't get that out of my mind because that's how I learned about them. You know, they used to come in San Francisco at Aquatic Park and try and convert me. Well, that's the, the reference that I have. But anyway, you mentioned that the revenue that was being generated out of Japan, and again, the Unification Church Moonies are, is a Korean organization, and they did have an American operation, but 80% of their revenues were coming from Japan back right. in the 1980s, I guess, during their heyday. Uh, that's uh, that we do have a data point that says that uh, that eighty percent of all of their global money at one point uh, was coming uh, from uh, Japan. Basically, that means you know getting Japanese families and Japanese believers to donate large sums of money. Uh, we don't uh, you know this is one of the things that uh, I'm hoping that uh, future journalists and future researchers, probably you know university level book writing people eventually get into and, and to really figure out because it's going to, it'll be a massive research project for whoever takes it on. But uh, what we, the outline of what we kind of have is that uh, how did this South Korean organization turn into a global organization? Well, this, that Japan was a key part of that. The money that the, that the Unification Church gained from sort of uh, their Japan following uh, was what fueled financially the expansion of the Unification Church globally and all that stuff we talk about in the early 80s uh, and the U in the U.S., that probably wouldn't have happened without the Japanese money. Yeah, so let's let's bring this back into focus then in terms of the assassination. So you mentioned it, that uh, the, uh, the individual who killed Abe um, two and a half weeks ago was very upset with the Unification Church because his mother donated, uh, it, well, I, the yen is so weak now, if we put it in the dollar terms, <laughs> like maybe $800,000 or something in that range. Anyway, a lot yes. of money. She basically bankrupted her family in order to give money to the church. And, uh, you know, I don't want to get into this too much, but many of these new religions, of course, they have a, a very strong revenue generation process, and certainly the Unification Church fell into that category. So he he was upset that his family was bankrupted, and he couldn't go to college, as you pointed out, because there were no funds. He was apparently a pretty smart kid and was eligible to go to school, but there was no money to pay for it. So he developed a resentment. This is now over 20 years ago regarding this church, which he felt exploited his mother. Is that correct, Michael? Am I characterizing that correctly? Uh, you put it very eloquently. That's exactly right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So he's being investigated right now, of course. And I read this morning that uh, they're, they're evaluating his psychological state. <laughs> Although I, what we just talked about, I, I think it's pretty clear. If it is indeed true, you could understand his antipathy to the Unification Church. One thing that was interesting also, Michael, in your analysis was that he actually wanted to assassinate the leaders of the Unification Church, either the 
you know, the world leaders, the, the Korean family, the Moon family, I guess, which still runs the church, I imagine, mm -hmm. or the Japanese leaders. And he couldn't get access to them, but he could get access to the prime minister, which is just amazing. The security for the church is better than the security for the former prime minister and one of the most important political people in, well, in I Japan. Think that, what what you is know, your comments about that? I mean, how can well, there be I a security that, lapse of that level? Well, you know, uh, during Japanese political campaigns, there's usually like a two week period before every major national election where uh, it's, uh, it's expected and common that uh, most or all Japanese politicians go out onto the streets and, and personally give speeches uh, uh, to, to public passing by and, and near mm -hmm. major train stations and in major squares. And uh, this, is, you know, this is just standard Japanese politics. They're, they're expected to come out and to engage directly with the public during that time. Uh, and of course, the Unification Church does not have any such practice. Uh, so uh, I think that, uh, you know, and, and Japan, you know, a couple of points that are worth making is uh, last year, uh, there was uh, a total of one person killed in Japan with a gun uh, all of last year. Yeah. It's 120 people, 120 right. million people, right? <laughs> so this is not the United States where tens of thousands of people are being killed every year by gun violence. It doesn't yeah. happen as much. And the weapon right. used by the man uh, was not even a gun that was bought. It was something he constructed himself quite carefully. I mean, uh, you know, it's clear that he was actually is uh, quite a smart kid uh, in mm -hmm. the sense that he has many, many skills. He was able to build his own gun. Uh, he did a lot of research about Abe, which was not common knowledge. And, and most of the research he did seems to have been accurate. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, so basically he had to build his own gun test fired it, uh, went through several models and prepared for a long time. Originally, yes, he wanted to go, he wanted to kill the leader of the Unification Church when she mm -hmm. visited uh, Japan, uh, I think it was last year, uh, he wasn't able to get access to the venue. And so he later settled on, well, he said, okay, if I wanna get revenge against the church, uh, the way that to do it is to, is to kill Abe. Uh, because and he knew this history that you mentioned in the article. That he we figured out about. the history. And he seems to have also calculated that by killing Abe, he would bring attention on the Unification Church and thus get uh, his revenge in that way. Well, he's right. It happened right, that because, way. Because, uh, as I mentioned, I wanted to talk with you about this as well. I think prior to the Abe assassination, the general public, including myself, had no idea that there was this connection between Abe and the Unification Church. But now we do know that. Well, and you know, even Japan political specialists, this wasn't on our radar at all. Wow. Okay. So, so it certainly is now. And the opposition party, such as it is in Japan, uh, for those of you that do follow Japanese politics at all, basically the Jiminto or the uh, Liberal Democratic Party has pretty consistently been in power since World War II. And the, in the recent election, which is just yeah. a couple of days after the assassination, they confirmed their majority holdings in the upper house and they have that in the lower house as well the diet it's called actually so that's that's the the political side of this but so the opposition party is going to begin to take a look at this and, and michael is, is this case uh, unusual or are there because there are other new religions in japan not just the unification church there's some local ones too that have been developed in japan and they tend to my impression is Correct me if I'm wrong. They tend to be politically very conservative. Maybe not as quite so bad or right wing as the Unification Church. But are there? Will there be other churches that are discovered that are actively involved in the political process and donating to the Jiminto or perhaps supporting them in a way? Let me take both of your questions. First, the one about the opposition parties, and then the one about uh, the other other religions that are involved in in Japanese politics. So yes, the opposition parties uh, are not unified. Uh, so the main opposition party is called the Constitutional Dem Democratic Party of Japan. And uh, they're kind of center left. Uh, and they do say that they're going to make some kind of investigation. But frankly, it, the state of the party is not very unified for, uh, right now. And, and in my view, they're, they're, they're pretty useless, frankly speaking. Uh, but the one to keep a, where maybe the, we should keep a little more on, eye on 
is uh, the Japan Communist Party. Uh, now I know people hear the word communist and they start thinking about Soviet Union and, and Red China and all the rest. Japan Communist Party is a very, very different sort of organization. It's basically a social democrat sort of party, but has a, a 100 year tradition uh, of, of sort of uh, uh, fighting for a, sort of a more liberal society. Mm -hmm. And uh, this party though is, has a, a, a national network. They have a newspaper called Akahata, Red Flag, which uh, uh, has almost a million subscribers. Wow. And when, when they go on an investigation, uh, they can be a little more serious because they have from time to time broken uh, a lot of stories, bring, brought things to public light that the normal media uh, that, that has, has missed. So, uh, so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't sort of say poo-poo the Japan Communist Party investigation. I would uh, take less seriously the one by the, the mainstream uh, Constitutional Democratic Party of Japan. Moving to religions. Um, yes, there are other. So according to the Japanese constitution, uh, there is a separation between religion uh, and politics in Japan. Yeah, I, I think that's true in the United States, Michael, but I, I haven't checked recently. Supposed yeah, to be yeah, that, that's two. true. Well, you know, <laughs> as, as people may know, I mean, the Japanese constitution was written by uh, the, the, the staff of uh, General MacArthur. Uh, mm -hmm. And the staff who wrote the constitution actually were were New Dealers. They were kind of very liberal-minded uh, followers of uh, Franklin Roosevelt. So mm -hmm. even though MacArthur was sort of a conservative figure, uh, his staff members who wrote the Constitution were very sort of liberal and progressive people uh, of, mm -hmm. of the 1940s. And um, so, uh, so even though there is this ban on, or there is not, there is supposed to be a separation between religion and politics. It, it's it, like anywhere else. Uh, this, you know, there, there is religious influence in politics. The biggest case of this is the uh, Komeito Party, which is part of the ruling coalition together. So this, the Liberal Democratic Party and Komeito have been the ruling coalition of Japan for the past couple decades. Uh, and uh, so they come from a Buddhist sect called Sokagakai. Uh, and uh, they are, you know, essentially a religious party that, that has the most power of all of them. There are a number of others who run candidates. Uh, you know, you, there's some really weird ones like the Happiness Realization Party. Uh, they'll they'll like march through town and do like uh, pro Donald Trump uh, rallies and things like this. Uh, and there are a number of others. Uh, most mm -hmm. of them are not taken very seriously by the Japanese public. Uh, you know, Japan is uh, you know while there is Shinto and Buddhism and and, and things like that, religion for most Japanese uh, sort of uh, lays very gently on their, their thinking and, and their society. They're, they're, not, they're not in the mainstream of very religiously minded people. They're very secular. Right, yeah, that was one of my major impressions when I came to, to uh, Japan the first time. So I went to high school in Texas and there were a lot of um, uh, born again Christian types in my high school, you know, and they were, prophesizing and trying to recruit me into that. So I was kind of used to that. And then I went to Japan and nobody talks about religion. In Japan, I was, wow, this is quite different. I've seen statistics where uh, the number of people who claim to be atheists or basically a religious in Japan is over half and maybe even higher. Yeah, the, the mainstream is, is, is very sort of not anti-religious, but just, as you say, a religious. They're just, it just isn't something that they, they, they think about or it's a great concern to them. But in corners here and there, you will find some Japanese who are very serious about their religion. Uh, there's a pretty strong a Christian contingent as well, you know, sort of more mainstream yeah, my, my, Christian. My father-in-law, they're, they're Christian. Yeah, so you will find that and they, they have their place. Uh, but, uh, you know, but the mainstream Japanese society, uh, essentially religion just isn't a, a big issue here. Yeah, so we'll have to see how these investigations go forward and if the Communist Party makes an impact. And yeah, I, I'm wondering how the Japanese people will respond to that, to know that these, these fringe parties uh, have had a, an impact on political strategy and structure over the Well, decades. slowly, you know, even now, the, 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 the story of the Unification Church to some degree is being reported. So at mm -hmm. the time that I reported it, uh, you know, several days after the assassination, the Japanese media was sort of treating, we're, we're just not talking about it. They, they wouldn't say who it was. 
they knew who it was. We knew they knew who it was. Yeah. And, and the information was all out there. But mm -hmm. the, the Japanese mainstream media just steadfastly refused to report it. But once I reported it and once other international news organizations started to report it a little bit, then finally it kind of came back to Japanese media. I, I've long identified this as the boomerang effect where mm -hmm. Japanese uh, me mass media will not cover many sort of taboo topics until it's first reported internationally. And then yeah. they can quote the international reports to kind of make it safe for them to report it back in Japan. Yeah. Uh, and so that, was, that happened, I think, in this case as well. Uh, so now, if, if we're talking about today, uh, I think most Japanese are pretty well aware that uh, of the motive of, of the man who, who, who killed uh, Shinzo Abe yeah. and the connections of the Unification Church. But that said, the exact connections between the, the ruling party and the Unification Church from the 1960s up until today, that research really still needs to be done. So that you think may fall to academics or perhaps uh, investigative journalists may take a look at it. I, I don't I, see I, the Yumuri newspaper or any of the dominant media sources in Japan taking no, the story. They're, they're not really great at investigative journalism on kind of a long, on a, a sort of a wide canvas, let's put it that way. Oh, yeah. I think it'll eventually be a, a book length treatment by some scholar in a university somewhere who will uh, really track it down and, and to give us the picture. All right, Michael. Well, I'm, we're unfortunately running out of time, but I did want to get your opinion about the ramifications for Japanese politics. So as you stated, Abe was the second most influential person in Japanese politics at the time of his assassination. And um, he was the head of the largest faction. The, the, the dominant party, as we mentioned, has been in power pretty much consistently since uh, the 1950s. 1955, yeah. Yeah, but they're broken into different groups. So Abe was the leader of one of the more conservative or right-wing groups, which is now leaderless. So how do you see this? Obviously, having the number two guy suddenly, in this dramatic way, be removed from the political balance of power that exists within Japan is going to have a profound impact on, on the future of Japan politics, I would think. Yeah. OK, so uh, in the very basic outline, since we have a very short time here. Uh, so. Uh, Kishida basically comes from the current prime minister, Fumio Kishida, comes from the more liberal part of the party. Uh, he's more of a centrist, whereas Abe was more of the far right wing of the party, uh, even though they work together fairly well as individuals. Uh, when uh, Kishida came to power uh, at the end of last year, uh, he was basically uh, probably envisioned by Abe as being a puppet and in a very weak position that Abe and his faction could control. However, things went unexpectedly well for Kishida. First of all, a politician who was expected to be kind of uh, controlling the party uh, ended up losing his election, who was an Abe ally. And this kind of gave some space to, to Kishida to, to uh, get more of his own independence and to bring in more of his own people. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, uh, Kishida did well in the general elections, which also boosted his status. Mm -hmm. And uh, so most up... In this year, up until Abe's assassination, you know, basically, you know, it was Kishida driving the car, but Abe was like jumping forward and trying to take control of the wheel and basically trying to uh, steer the country in his preferred direction rather than in the prime minister's preferred direction. So with Abe basically suddenly assassinated and then uh, his uh, his faction basically now with no effective leader and, and possibly going to break up. Uh, into multiple factions, uh, in, in, that's one possibility. But in any case, it's a lot weaker. Um, for the point of view of the prime minister, suddenly he's actually in control of the nation, especially when you, when you add the fact that he just won the upper house elections as well in a convincing faction. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, up until Abe's assassination, there were two men sort of fighting for control of the government's policies. Now one of those men is gone. Kishida's mm -hmm. really in charge. Uh, he still has to basically throw a lot of red meat to the hard right because they're a powerful group within the ruling party. Mm -hmm. But uh, he is uh, in the driver's seat for the first time since he became prime minister. Wow. So uh, 
Michael, it sounds, you know, we, you've lived in Japan for a long time, as, as I have. And generally, my expectations about leadership or change out of the Japanese government is, if it's not zero, it's very close. But it sounds like maybe from your perspective, the possibility for some progressive change in Japan it, it could happen? Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say progressive change. Uh, okay, but I, but I, would, I would say that uh, Japan right now is firmly under the control of a very sane moderate reasonable person i see all right well michael the time has flown by uh, we could talk about this i think for uh, easily hours um so i want to thank you again and then remind the viewers that if you do want to find out more information about this connection between religion and japanese politics which mirrors of course in the american politics as well since trump has also endorsed the unification church recently to go to uh, Michael's website, the, you can get to news agency website and you can see the articles that are listed there. Any other um, sources you wanna recommend, Michael, or, or any other way to find out more about your work or, or your, your agency's work? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, the webpage is the place to go. Also, I should say where we're really the most active is on Twitter. So at Shingetsu News, uh, that's where we do sort of our daily reporting. Uh, the, the website is used more for uh, features several times a week. Uh, but uh, I must say that, you know, uh, the Japanese media is almost as a block, including the English language media, basically uh, right of center. Uh, and so okay. we're basically the only uh, sort of left of center uh, media in English that you're going to find, basically, more or less. All right. All right, Michael. Well, thank you so much. Really enjoyed talking with you again and look forward to meeting you uh when we can rendezvous up in Tokyo next time. So to my viewers, uh, we'll be on the air again in a couple of weeks. And I'm gonna cover this uh, interesting immigration program that the Japanese government has set up in collaboration um, with a foundation affiliated with uh, the International Christian University to bring Ukrainian students into the country. We're gonna have two Ukrainian students on Kansai Gaida campus where I'm a professor uh, starting next month. It's very, very interesting. This is unprecedented because generally the Japanese government's approach to refugees is not very positive. But when it's come to the Ukrainians, uh, Japan has opened up their doors uh, much more wider than they ever have before. So I'll be interviewing the person who spearheaded this program in the next show. Again, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you very much. This is Looking to the East. I'm Steve Zerker. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.